Good morning, Hinton Alliance Church. It is great to see everybody um, who is here joining with us in person, and welcome to you as well who are joining us online. Um, we just want to welcome you to this time of worship. I'm excited to join together as we worship our Savior. Is um, almost fresh snow outside, just a couple days old, and um, those of you who aren't here haven't seen, but Christmas decorations in the foyer, really definitely feeling that this is the time of year um, that I love most, a time of year where we celebrate the birth of our Savior. And no matter what is going on in the world around us, that never changes. Um, we have a Savior who was born, who lived, and who died, and who was risen from the grave. And so we celebrate that this morning. We have a few um, announcements before we get going with our service. Just want to remind you about our special communion service coming up on the 13th. For those of you who haven't felt comfortable joining us in person, um, this is a service where we're going to not only be following the recommendations, or sorry, not only the guidelines, but also the recommendations. So um, masks are, well, masks are always required now, um, but also no singing. We're going to limit the attendance to 50 just to help those of you feel maybe a bit more comfortable coming. So that's the 13th. Um, it's going to be going on at, I think it's 8 30 in the morning. You can sign up. We are asking people to sign up for this. Contact Wendy if you have questions. And then also coming up on the 20th is our blue Christmas service. And it's going to be six o'clock at night. And what this is, it's a recognition that the holiday season isn't always necessarily a joyful time for people. Um, people who have experienced loss, people who aren't able to be with family and loved ones. And so we want to set aside December 20th, that evening, is a time to spend in lament and recognizing that there are sorrows, there are griefs in our lives, um, and ultimately looking to Jesus as the hope, even in the midst of those. So if you can, can register for that, um, you can go on our website, contact Wendy, that's December 20th. One more thing I wanted to share with you, we are sad to have to cancel our Christmas dinner, um, and this is not 100% canceled, but just a canceled for now until we can come back together, enjoy a meal together in fellowship. Um, so for now that is canceled, we're hoping that um, hopefully maybe a Ukrainian Christmas or Chinese New Year, something like that. We will still be planning on getting together. Um, so if you um, have paid already, you can talk to Wendy to get reimbursed for that. And then one last thing, Tovember, our collection of socks, mix and, mitts, and toques ends tomorrow. Um, so that's that Christmas-wrapped box out in the foyer. Um, so these are socks, mitts, and toques that are going to um, the homeless, the needy in our community. So that ends on Monday. However, the winter hug for the homeless is continuing until the 13th. So if you have mitts, toques, gloves, get those here by tomorrow um, for the winter hugs. Those we um, will be collecting for those until the 13th. Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we enter into this time of worship together. Father God, we thank you so much for your love and your grace in our lives. We thank you for this season. We thank you for the promise and the hope that this season brings us. Um, we praise you and we thank you. You are a good and a loving God. And no matter what the world throws at us, that will never change. We pray, God, that as we gather together now in worship, as we gather, some of us physically in person, some of us online, we thank you that your spirit is the same no matter where we're at, that your spirit meets us where we are at. And we pray that this time would be a, a sweet time of hearing from you, of singing your praises, um, that it would be a blessing to you and um, in that a blessing to us. We thank you, Father, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, it's nice to see all your masked faces. I just want to preface this song, Stones, with the scripture that it was based on, Luke 19, 37, 40. As he, Jesus, was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the fairies and seas in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. And may that be the testimony of our lives, not to be quiet about our faith in God.
find me in the valley Standing with my hands held high The valley will never take my song Find me in the desert Holding on to you for life The desert will never take my song the desert will never take my song and i will praise you i will praise you i won't let the storms cry i won't let the storms cry out. i will praise you the promise dancing where you prophesied still shouting of everything you've done high up on the mountain i was made to testify forever you will have my song Here's a song we haven't sung before here. This song is made uh, from verses out of Psalm 25. And Psalm 25 is a Psalm of David where 
he's expressing, if you read the whole chapter, it's clear he's in distress, but he's putting his trust in God to rescue him from the trouble he's in. So as we sing this, let's put our trust and put our hope in the Lord.
Lord, even in the midst of trials and struggles, Lord, you are good. lyrics again. Thank you. 
clothed in rainbows with living colors, flashes of lightning, rolls of thunder. Blessing and honor, strength and glory and power be to you, the only wise King.
You know, this season is one of those times where, you know, one thing I love about Christmas is it's the, the world can't help but celebrate. Even when they don't necessarily know what they're celebrating, the season, as we look at Christ's birth, as we prepare for this celebration, this Advent, and it seems a bit early because it's still November, but we're entering into this time of Advent where we pause and we reflect and we remember. We specifically remember that time leading up to the birth of Christ, when the world was waiting for the fulfillment of this promise that God had given. And for us, we're waiting still as we wait for the final fulfillment when Christ comes again. And in a time where so many distractions are around us, when there's so much chaos and turmoil, I think it's even easier to forget what this season is about. It's easy to forget when it seems as though so much of what our normal Christmas usually is seems to be taken away as we're pulled away from loved ones and friends as our normal day-to-day routines have been taken away from us. But the challenge for us is to remember, what is Christmas? Well, this is Christmas, God with us. That's why we celebrate. And as we enter into this Advent season, my prayer is that as we spend time over these next few Sundays, remembering, celebrating, that we would not forget what Christmas is. So we'll play. Advent, the arrival of a notable person, thing, or event. We await the advent of so many things in life, whether it's marriage, children, a job, retirement, the end of COVID-19. But let's not forget that the greatest advent the greatest arrival has already happened. And this Advent brings us something we could all use a little bit more of, hope. This is Christmas. But the Lord watches over those who fear him, those who rely on his unfailing love. He rescues them from death and keeps them alive in times of famine. We put our hope in the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. Let your unfailing love surround us, Lord, for our hope is in you alone. That's right. Psalm 33, 18 to 22. 2020 has been quite the year. So many people have found that the things that they put their hope in weren't able to stand up to the stresses and struggles that this year has brought. For a lot of people, 
This year has felt like a famine. People have lost jobs. They've been unable to spend time with family and friends. Some people have lost loved ones, not even been able to, being able to say goodbye. If our hope is placed in any of these things, we're going to face great disappointment. But there is a hope that will never come up short. There is a hope that will never let us down. And that hope is in the unfailing love of God. Even when everything in this world seems to be falling apart, the love of God never falls apart. This is Christmas. This is Jesus. Long before he was born, a promise was made that his name will be the hope of all the world. God shows us his unfailing love by sending Jesus to be our hope. He is the one that promises that even if the whole world were to pass away, his love never will. Jesus came to be hope for the world, and this hope will never disappoint us. This hope will never fail. This hope is for everyone who will receive it. And when we accept this hope, we become messengers of hope, spreading the good news of Jesus and his unfailing love. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for your unfailing love. Thank you that even when everything else is falling apart, your love never fails. Thank you that we have hope because of Jesus. When life gets hard, when we face struggles and stresses, help us to focus on the hope we have been given through Jesus. Help us to be messengers of that hope, sharing the good news of Jesus wherever we go. Amen. We light this candle as a reminder that this is Christmas. This is the never failing hope we have in Jesus. And we will light our candles next week. As again, we're faced with some of the chaos and turmoil in this world, we will light a candle in our minds to remember this hope that we have in Christ. <laughs> um, at this point, we'll, we'll dismiss the kiddos to go to Sunday school. If you guys want to head on to Sunday school, age three to grade six. We are continuing through the book of Ephesians. And last week, we hit a bit of a milestone, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, but this transition in the book of Ephesians, in this letter that Paul has written to the Ephesians church and to us. And we come to this point where the focus that we find in this next passage is unity. You know, unity is one of those things that, I think on the surface, everybody, no matter who you are, where you're from, you want to see happen. Even in our society, people love to see unity take place. The problem comes in when we start defining unity and when we start talking about what it should look like, how we should attain it. Because for me, when unity looks like everybody agreeing with me and agreeing with my opinions and beliefs, then I love unity. Other times in the world, it seems like unity can be just silencing those with a different opinion or forcing conformity under, you know, what society can deem as tolerance or acceptance. And so what we find is as we come together seeking unity, there can actually be great disunity in how we define it, how we pursue it. And so we come to this section in Paul's letter where he is calling the church to unity. And we see that he isn't actually calling them to pursue unity or to seek after unity, but instead to hold on to, to maintain the unity that they already have been given. And this makes sense because we've read about the gospel being what brings Jews and Gentiles together. That yes, although there is diversity, God brings us all, no matter what our background is, together in the gospel, that we are all equal in Christ. And so this unity we've been given, how do we maintain it? How do we hold on to it in the midst of a world that seems bent on disunity? 
Look with me, Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to look at verses 1 to 6 this morning. Therefore I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling. For you have been called by God. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. For there is one body and one Spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, in all, and living through all. Father God, we pray as we come to your word this morning, we know that unity is only something that you give. It is only something that we can hold on to and maintain by the power of your spirit. And so as we, as we dive into your word this morning, as we come face to face with, with some difficult truths about unity, some difficult truths about what unity is and how we're called to pursue it, I pray, God, that I would not say anything that contradicts your word. God, would your spirit speak clearly to our hearts this morning? Would be, we be willing and ready and open to your truth, to your call in our lives? As Paul prayed just before this in Ephesians, we pray that your spirit would fill us with all the fullness of God. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we dive into this passage this morning, it's important for us to remember where we've come from, where we've been so far, because this, this section is placed where it's at for a reason. As I said earlier, this is a, a key point in the letter that Paul writes here. It comes at this transition point where Paul is pivoting from kind of the first three chapters where he's focused on theology and doctrine and teaching truth to where what we read last week with Pastor Kevin, what he looked into this prayer of, God, we've learned this, now by your Spirit, would you enable us? By your Spirit, would you fill us with all the fullness of God? And now we're coming into this roughly second half of the letter where Paul has transitioned to the practical. How does this play out in our lives? How do these truths of the, the glorious riches found in Christ how does the truth that we were dead in sin but have been made alive in Christ, or that God is displaying his manifold wisdom through the church to the, the rulers of the spiritual realm, how do these things actually work out in our lives? It's important to see that the, the path that Paul takes, because he doesn't just jump from the theology, the truth, to the practical, but there's this pivotal transition point, which is that prayer that Pastor Kevin focused on last week. Because if we try to just jump to the practical without the power of the Spirit of God working in our lives, it's impossible. If we try to stay on one side without moving to the other, we find ourselves caught up with a bunch of head knowledge but without much practical use. Charles Spurgeon puts it this way, truth must enter into the soul, penetrate and saturate it, or else it is of no value. Doctrines held as a matter of creed are like bread in the hand, which ministers no nourishment to the frame. But doctrine accepted by the heart is as food digested, which by assimilation sustains and builds up the body. It's important that we don't get wrapped up just in the head knowledge and not move to the practical. But I think sometimes we can do this. We can hear Ephesians 1 to 3. We can hear that we were dead in our sin and we're made alive in Christ. And yet we can treat sin as though it were something that didn't lead to death. We can know in our minds that Christ's love for us is immeasurable, but we can struggle to accept it when we mess up or when we feel alone or abandoned. We know in our minds that God gives us the Holy Spirit but we never pause to listen for his voice when we need vision and direction. And so it's important we don't just stick to the head knowledge, that we allow it to come in and penetrate our hearts and work out into the practical in our lives. 
But it's also important we go, don't go to the other end of the spectrum, where we just focus on the practical while we leave out the doctrine, the theology, the truth. It's equally as dangerous. Because you see, we can try to do good and we can forget the fact that it's only by the Spirit of God's work in our life that we can ever do good. Or like we're going to look at today, we can fight for unity, but in an unhealthy way. Or probably the worst case, we can let go of the essential truths of who Jesus is for the sake of tolerance and what we might deem as love without realizing that in letting go of those things, we're actually leading ourselves and others further away from God instead of towards him. And so we see this journey that Paul takes us on from understanding these amazing, awe-inspiring truths of who he is, of who Christ is, then praying for God's Spirit to lead us in these things, to fill us with his Spirit, and all of this so that we can then live out those truths that we've been taught. All that so that by the power of the Spirit, our lives could be transformed into the image of Christ to actually reflect those truths that we've been given. And it's important we see this because the very first verse we come to here, therefore I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. Lead a life worthy of your calling. And so we just spend three chapters talking about this calling that God has placed on our lives, the immeasurable riches that we have in Christ, the magnitude of his calling on us. Now lead a life worthy of it, deserving of it. Lead a life that reflects these truths. Easy, right? Except when somebody cuts us off when we're driving or we get laid off of work or our kids just won't listen or our spouse does that one thing that just grates on us or COVID-19 becomes a thing. This isn't easy. Living out these things isn't something that naturally as humans we can just do on our own. We live in a fallen and broken world, and not only do we live in that world, but we're a part of that world. And so it's important that we read this in context to understand this isn't something we can just do on our own. We can't just read these words and decide, yep, I'm going to do that today. It only comes through the Holy Spirit filling our lives with the fullness of God. For us to live things out, it is absolutely essential that we go to God, that we pray for his spirit to fill us and empower us to live this out. Kevin and I were talking this past week and just looking at this, um, these passages and realizing, you know, Ephesians 1 to 3 doesn't require a whole lot for, from us to accept. It doesn't require a whole lot. But here's the thing, if we want to truly accept and embrace Ephesians chapter 1 to 3, then we also have to truly accept God's Spirit working in our lives to produce those things. It's us going from just holding the bread in our hands to actually eating it and consuming it and allowing it to soak in and nourish us. And so again, it's important to understand that this isn't legalism. This isn't do these things so that you can earn God's favor. It isn't live worthy so that then you can earn what God has given you. It also isn't a free pass to say, well, God's given this to me so I can live however I want. But it's that understanding that this is what we're going into now is the spirit-empowered byproduct of those first three chapters, of understanding that we are in Christ. The natural byproduct by the work of his spirit is living a life worthy of the calling that he's placed on us. And so the question is, are we ready for that? Are we ready to embrace God's Spirit working inside of us? Are we ready to surrender control to Him? Because that's the only way to experience a new life that He's purchased for us. And as we continue on in this passage, here's why it's important. It's that true unity can only come by the Spirit of God. Unity apart from Christ and His Spirit is not true unity at all. Because to have unity, certain things have to be going on in our lives, and those things can only be produced by the Holy Spirit. 
true unity goes against the very fiber of who we are as humans under the curse of sin. It isn't something that's easy to accomplish. We can't just sit back and watch it happen. In fact, if we sit back and watch, it's going to fall apart very quickly. But it's something that we've been given, but we have to maintain. It's a gift, but it's something that we have to fight to hold on to and live out. And this is the, the call that we find in chapter, or verses 2 to 6 of chapter 4. And there's three stages to this passage that I want to walk through with you. First, it's that personal responsibility. What is my responsibility in this? What do I have to bring to the table for unity here in this room, here in this church to actually take place? Second, what is our corporate responsibility together? As we come together, what is our responsibility in how we act, respond, interact with and towards one another? And finally, what is the foundation? What is this unity actually built on? And then what does that say about anything and everything else, any other issue, event, preference that might come in to threaten this unity? And so first, let's look at this, our personal responsibility. Always be humble and gentle. Just two things, but probably two of the hardest things to live out. Let's start with humility. Sir Edie Holtz, who is a British politician in the 1800s, said, humility is a strange thing. The minute you think you've got it, you've lost it. Humility is hard to define and even harder to live out. But over and over again in Scripture, we find this call to be humble, to live in humility. And so in, in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, we're given a pretty good definition of humility. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. We don't like to be humble. We don't like to think of other people as greater than ourselves. But here in this passage in the Philippians, we're giving both what not to do and what to do in order to live a life that is humble. And we see that it's don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. But we are naturally selfish creatures. We naturally look out for ourselves and our own needs and our own desires. We also like to impress others, whether it's with tangible things that we have or gifts or attributes or abilities that we have. We like to impress. But humility is the exact opposite of those things. Humility is laying those things aside and putting others ahead of yourself. And there's a lot of things that we could spend time on in this idea of humility and what this looks like. But I want to focus in on one because I think it's something that speaks a lot to what we're all going through right now in our world around us, and that is humility and providing for ourselves. It says, don't be selfish. And I think many times when we think of being selfish, we think of luxury. We think of what comes after we make sure that our basic needs are taken care of. In our Western democratic society, we've been taught what are certain needs, what are certain rights that we have. We call them our, our God-given rights safety, health, freedom to do and say what we want. And as soon as somebody infringes on those things, we're very quick to let them know about it. We're very quick to say something and often not in the best of ways. But here's what I want to challenge you with this morning. As Christians, we are citizens of God's kingdom. The Bible says we're sojourners or temporary residents on this earth. We're not citizens of this world. And what that means is that we have no rights on the earth. Our rights, our citizenship is in eternity. And so this world doesn't owe us anything. We need to remember that. The kingdom that we serve is the kingdom of God. And this life that we're living now here on this earth is just a stop on the way to get there. But it's a very crucial, a very necessary stop. Listen to this from 1 Peter chapter 2, 11 and 12. Dear friends, I warn you as temporary residents and foreigners to keep away from worldly desires that wage war against your very soul. 
I think sometimes when we think of that worldly desires, we think, oh, those are the really bad sins. I think it's anything in this world that we could desire, anything. It says, be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors. Then if they accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your honorable behavior and they will give honor to God when he judges the world. Everything this world has to offer us, whether it's safety, health, prosperity, rights, privileges, should have absolutely no bearing on how we live our lives. We are temporary residents here. And so our conduct, the way we act, should not reflect the citizenship of this earth. It should reflect our citizenship in heaven. And so we, wouldn't, we shouldn't be fighting for what we think we need in this world, even if we've been told our entire lives that it's a need or a right that we have. Our conduct should be a witness to our neighbors. So when they look at our lives, they see God. When they look at our lives, they're pointed to God and they give honor to God. Our lives on this earth are a witness. That is our purpose. Not fighting for our rights, but fighting for our neighbors to see Jesus. That's humility. It's considering the eternal state of our neighbor as greater than ourselves as caring more about whether our neighbor knows Jesus than about our own rights or needs. We're temporary residents here. Humility is absolutely essential if we want to see unity happen. Humility in our lives, letting go of what we think we need, letting go of what we think we are, we should have, that we have been guaranteed in this life. Our citizenship is in heaven. And we've been placed here by God. We've been left here by God to point others to him so that others can gain that citizenship, so that others can see and know him. And so we have to ask ourselves, am I willing to hold out with an open hand everything that this world has to offer? Everything in this world, am I willing to let it go? so that our neighbors and our family and our friends will see Christ. The second thing we're called to is gentleness. And this is another word that can can be difficult to define. Um, The word in the Greek can be gentle or meekness. I think oftentimes when we think of this, we can think weak or soft. But I want us to think about it this way. Weakness doesn't have to strive to be gentle. Softness doesn't have to strive to be meek. It's strength, boldness, confidence that has to strive to be gentle, that has to strive to be meek. Listen, we have a confidence that comes in knowing Christ. We have a boldness of the truth of his word. And so gentleness isn't letting go of those bold convictions that God gives us in his word. Boldness isn't being weak as though we aren't citizens of the kingdom of God. But gentleness has everything to do with how we present those things to those around us. James 3.13 says, Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. Here's the thing, we don't change how we live our lives. We don't change the actions that flow out of our understanding of who God is and who he's created us to be. But we show it, we speak it, with meekness and gentleness. And so we don't come barging in, forcing our way in, and heaven help those who get in our way. We are not bulls charging in. But Jesus calls us to be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. As we speak truth, yes, we speak it boldly. We have the word of God that is truth. We have the gospel message that is the only hope for the world. And so we don't back off of that in weakness. We boldly proclaim that. But let's make sure that we don't leave a trail of bodies in our wake because that isn't, gent- that isn't gentleness. Galatians 6.1 tells us, Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path. I think this is another challenge in our lives to be gentle. We don't change what the scripture says about sin. 
We don't change what is right and what is wrong. We are called to hold each other accountable, that when somebody is caught in sin, we help them back onto the right path. But again, with gentleness. This isn't fire and brimstone. This isn't yelling and berating or shaming. We don't come into it offended or upset. If these things are controlling our heart, the anger and the resentment, then we need to back off because at that point, we're not considered a part of the godly. So those of you who are godly help the person back on the right path. Proverbs 15.1 tells us that a gentle answer deflects anger, but harsh words make tempers flare. Again, coming in guns blazing isn't going to help. When we see a brother or a sister caught in sin, we need to first check our own hearts, examine our own hearts. And if we're overcome in any way by anger or malice or offense, don't put ourselves in that position of restoration. Because if we come in in anger and malice, then nothing good is going to come of it. But instead, the call is to come in in gentleness and humility. And if we say, I'm too invested, I'm too hurt by this, then we back off and we let somebody else who can be gentle, who can go in in gentleness and humility, help that other person out of the sin. Again, it's this, uh, this balance. It isn't weakness. It isn't letting go of the truth of God's word. But it's making sure that when we address it, when we speak it, we're doing so in a way that is gentle and meek, where we aren't causing hurt and pain, but we're seeking to build up and restore. And so the challenge as believers in our personal lives as we gather together, humility and gentleness, not letting go of the truth of God's word, not letting go of the truth of who we are in Christ, but approaching those around us as those seeing others as greater than ourselves, as laying aside what we deem as our needs and our wants and our rights for the sake of others that they may be built up. The next aspect we come to to uh, maintaining this unity is our corporate responsibility. And what we find is these are directly connected to our personal responsibilities. Because if we aren't living out those first two things, if we aren't allowing God's Spirit to produce humility and gentleness in our lives, then as we come together as His body, we aren't going to be able to do these next things. But what we find is that as we each personally are seeking Christ, and as we are allowing his spirit to work in our lives to create humility and gentleness, then as we come together as his body, we find these next two things. First is be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. I'll be the first to say that this isn't easy. Our natural reaction to someone's faults is to take offense, to point them out, to gossip about them. But that shouldn't be the case. 1 Peter 4.8 tells us, most important of all, continue to show deep love for each other, for love covers a multitude of sins. As we walk in love towards each other, which only comes from knowing Christ's love for us, sin is covered up. And now, not in the sense of hiding it or not dealing with it or pretending that it isn't there, but it's covered over in that we don't take offense. We're quick to forgive, even when the person doesn't recognize their own sin. And maybe we have to address it, but we do so in love. We do so in gentleness and humility. Again, we don't treat sin in another believer's life as a way to, you know, as an avenue to shame or embarrass them, but as an avenue to build them up. And so what if they've done the same thing over and over and over again? So what if you're convinced in your mind that what they're doing is wrong? Walk in love. Show patience. And again, this takes humility and gentleness. This isn't easy. It isn't easy to be burned and then to continue walking side by side with the person who's hurt you. I want to use my, my wife as an example. And yes, I asked her permission to share this story. 
And so last year, she was putting our girls to bed, and um, bedtime isn't always easy in our home. And so she was laying with the girl. She was laying with Bria, and Bria was kind of flopping around, flailing her arms around, and her hand came into contact with Patricia's eye, specifically her nail with Patricia's eye, and it cut it really bad. She couldn't see for a few days. She had to go to the doctor. It was really bad, and she had to put drops in it. It was swollen. Um, Then if that wasn't bad enough, just about a month ago, the cut reopened again, and Patricia ended up at the ER, more drops, more, more stuff to take care of it. Now, we've told Bria over and over again, when you go to bed, you don't flail around, you don't lay around. That night, Patricia had told her, lay still, it's time to go to sleep. But Bria wasn't listening. And the effect of her sin and disobedience was extremely painful for Patricia. But I'll be the first to tell you that that in no way affected their relationship with one another. There was immediate forgiveness. Yes, you let, we let Bria know what you did was wrong, and it led to mommy getting hurt. But we still lay with her at night when she needs us. Patricia still snuggles her and holds her, even if she's flailing around and not listening. It's a love of a mother for her daughter. It's a love that covers over a multitude of sins, that addresses it, that disciplines it, yes, but that doesn't allow it to come between that relationship. And it should be the same for us in the church. When we come together, we will hurt each other. Other people will say or do things that hurt you. You will say and do things that hurt other people. That's the fact of this life. And we look forward to eternity when that isn't the case. But for right now, it's just the fact of the matter. And what Jesus calls us to, what the Spirit of God empowers us to do, is love people through that, to make allowance for their sin, to approach them in love and patience and kindness. (laughs) So when you experience the sin of another believer, when you are hurt, when you're burned or embarrassed or ashamed or irritated by the sin of another believer, Does your love allow you to be patient? Does your love lead you to make allowance for the behavior of that other child of God? Does your love allow you to remove any possibility of offense? Even when that person's sin or perceived sin imposes on our needs and our rights, Are we willing to, in humility, lay those things aside and continue to come together in love and patience and forgiveness? The second thing we're called to to do together as his body, make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. And here's where unity comes into play. Are we fighting for our unity? Are we fighting to bind ourselves together? It's only at this point when we, as we've walked through this idea of humility and gentleness, of walking with each other in patience and bearing with one another's sin, that we can ever hope to find ourselves come together united. It's only when we lay aside our own agenda our own desires, our own needs, our own opinions, that we can stand united in the Spirit of God. We live in a time right now that is fighting to tear us apart. Satan is attacking the household of God, and the greatest weapon he's using isn't from outside, it's from within. The enemy is fighting to drive us apart from one another, and he's using the turmoil and the chaos of the world to convince us that we need to take sides, that we need to convinced that we need to fight to persuade other people. But all these things are distractions. But don't they matter? Don't government regulations, doesn't the health and well-being of me and my family, doesn't my freedom matter? Well, short answer, no. 
Because our unity in the Spirit has absolutely nothing to do with those things. COVID, no COVID, masks, no masks, laws, no laws, opinions, agendas, conspiracies, truths, none of it matters. Because our unity in the Spirit is built on other things. And this is where this passage ends. For there is one body and one Spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, in all, and living through all. This is the source of our, of our unity. This is the foundation of our unity. One body, which is the church. One spirit, the Holy Spirit of God. Our glorious hope, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ. One Lord, Jesus Christ. One faith, Christ and him crucified. One baptism in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. One God and Father of all, who is over all, in all, and living through all. That's what matters. And anything that falls outside of those things has, should have absolutely no say in whether we can come together as his church in unity. What we believe about laws or government, our health, our rights, our needs, we lay it aside in humility and gentleness, loving one another as Christ has loved us. Again, there's so many things fighting to drive us apart, fighting to cause division. Don't let them in. They don't matter. It doesn't matter who's elected. It doesn't matter how long this pandemic lasts or if there is a pandemic. It doesn't matter whether we think the laws of the land are just or unjust. When it comes to us gathering together as Christ's body, as his witnesses to the world, none of that stuff matters. We are temporary residents of this world. Our reason, our purpose for being left here is to be witnesses of God's love to the world around us. And it is through us, the church, that God has chosen to express his manifold wisdom. Are we living as though this is the case? Are we focused on our own ambitions, our own thoughts and agendas? Or is our goal what we're striving for? The unity in God's spirit. Even as we gather today, we have a, a picture of how believers can hold different opinions as those of us gather here in person, as there's some of us who are gathering via the live stream, those who gladly put on a mask, those who struggle to put on a mask. Are we going to allow this to drive a wedge between us? Are we going to allow the chaos and turmoil and opinions of the world to interfere with the unity among us. When it comes to the happenings of this world, I'm clueless. I don't get it. I don't understand COVID. I don't understand how governments work or why one party is elected and not another. I don't understand why there's racism. I don't understand why some have plenty and some have nothing. I don't understand why some are healthy and some are plagued with sickness. I just don't know. But what I do know is this. There is one body and one spirit, just as we have been called to one glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all, in all, and living through all. And I'll stand on that. I will hold on to that. Everything else is a vapor in the wind. Will we come together as his church Will we let go of everything that is peripheral? And will we hold on to the only thing that will bring us together in true unity? Will we hold on to the truth found in God's word? Will we be willing to let everything else go for the sake of the unity of this body, of Hinton Alliance Church? God, we come to you recognizing Unity without you is impossible. There's too many things in this world that would create division. Too many things that try to force us to take a stand 
to convince other people, to try to persuade other people. There's so many distractions. Now, Father, we look to you, the source of everything that is good. Would you remove anything within us that gets in the way of what your spirit is doing? Would we be ready and willing to be transformed by your spirit, to be filled with all the fullness of God? We cannot walk in humility and gentleness on our own. We cannot make allowance for the sin of others on our own. We cannot walk in unity on our own. It takes a move of your spirit. So, Father, we pray for your spirit to be poured out. Would your spirit be poured out into our lives, into the life of this church? May our focus be where it should be. Would the peripheral things, would the distractions be, be moved to the side? Would we be able to come together in unity, standing firmly on your word, standing firmly on the gospel of Jesus Christ, that we may be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the world. We pray this in Christ's name. Wow, that was a powerful message. There was times I wanted to say amen, but I had my mask on. <laughs> it was too chicken. Thank you so much, Ryan. Like, God just seems to have a, you just have a laser of what to share. It's so pertinent for this time. There's so much to consider in that. I'm going to close with a song called Overcome. Destined to die, poured out for all mankind. I'm God's only Son, perfect and spotless one. He never sinned or suffered as if he did.
overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Everyone overcome. We will overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Everyone King Solomon was the wisest man in the world. He had everything at his fingertips. And he explored everything there was to explore. And then he wrote a book about it, Ecclesiastes. And this is the way he starts out. These are the words of the teacher, King David's son, who ruled in Jerusalem. Everything is meaningless, says the teacher. Completely meaningless. can't get more blunt than that. <laughs> he sought after wisdom. He sought after folly. He sought after treasure. He sought after having nothing. But everything in the world that he sought meaning in, he found to come up short. And he ends the book with this. Here now is my final conclusion. Fear God and obey his commands, for this is everyone's duty. The only meaning he found, the only purpose he found, was in God himself. Our unity can only be found in this. And let's not forget the turmoil and the chaos of our world is fighting to take our eyes off of Jesus. Our hope, our joy, our peace, everything that we need is found in Christ. And our lives should reflect this. Our unity should reflect this. One Lord, one faith, one, da- one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, in all, and living through all. We thank you, Father. We thank you for the hope and the peace and the love and the joy that we find in Christ. We thank you for this season as we reflect on his birth. The ultimate picture of humility, God himself become man. And then to be nailed to a cross and die in our place. 
but who three days later rose in victory. And so today we serve a conquering king. And when so much tries to distract us, help us not forget. Help us not forget. Help us to walk in boldness and the truth of your word and the gospel of Jesus Christ. But may we be humble and gentle and forgiving and loving and kind. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.